There's some very tangible and real things to be afraid about. Not just from the cops who were scary because they got badges and guns and twisted machos that they want to show off, but from inmates who may be ignorant, uninformed, in a desperate situation trying to find somebody else to look down on, which creates a social gestalt that makes fear a very tangible and real thing to a lot of people. And I was holding Phyllis's hand as she was going through the struggle about what to do about all of this, uh, listening to her uh, as she cried because of bathroom assignments in City Hall and other inconveniences. Uh, but after a long time, we succeeded in getting rid of the ordinance whereby so where she was subject to arrest 24 hours, seven days a week. That's the hurdle. We're still not completely through. I think the bathroom issue comes up every once in a while. Well, we have now a mayoral uh, a statement of policy to resolve that issue. And that's the first time we've had that. We're making progress. We're not through. There's still a need of a movement. And I want to tell all those folks out there that say it's over, we need to assimilate, get on with their lives and forget this. No. Not for all of us, maybe for some of us who have got enough resources that they don't have to worry, uh, they're protected by their privilege, but most of us are not. But I was also told that as soon as I stepped in the VA's office dressed as Phyllis, I was going to be arrested. And so that's what was going on. It was fixing to, it was fixing to get real nasty real fast. We all lived in uh, very tangible fear that we may have to go to jail. And if you're afraid of going to jail, you're already under control. She does not want to be in the camera. I'm the public person. She's the private person. But everything that I went through back then, she was right there beside me. The loss of my job, the loss of our income, the threat of me being arrested on a daily basis as I went about lobbying to get rid of this uh, ordinance. Uh, every day that she left to go to work, she didn't know if when she came home if I was going to be in jail or not. And I know it was a terrifying experience for her. I also know that uh, during all this time, um, when I was in law school and still trying to get rid of the uh, ordinance that, that one night some people, uh, some very ugly people uh, from the Young Americans for Freedom at the University of Houston campus came to our house and I wasn't there and they started banging on the windows and threatening to sexually assault her and just scared the living fool out of her. Um, she also went through all of the uh, graffiti on our house and the slash tires and uh, all the other obscene phone calls and things that, that we went through. So. Uh, couldn't have done it without her, and uh, she knows the story as well as I do. And meanwhile, I'm still lobbying, and uh, I started going back to school, because many of y'all know that I am an engineer with two engineering degrees from Texas A&M, but the engineering community in Houston blackballed me from getting work, so I used my GI Bill uh, and went back to school, and in the fall of 1977, I'd been accepted by both the business college and the law college, so I started a combined degree. And 77 to 78, I did my first year uh, at U of H to get, get uh, most of my MBA hours. And then starting in uh, 78, fall of 78, I started in uh, law school uh, at the University of Houston. And my first year at law school could take up another hour. It was not fun. I remember the days when it was against the law. Yeah, and I would pack up a nice chest and a suitcase and, and go to a motel and shut myself up there for the whole weekend. Yeah. yeah. And uh, so, you know, she did some great things to, for all of us. She opened the door and we all came out. Well, in a sense, we all came out. <laughs> and we were able to go out in public. So, but up until then, it's, it's risky. You can go to jail. Do you want to say your name? I'm Josephine Titsworth, by the way. And, uh, for well, whatever that's about to work. <laughs> and, uh, but Phyllis uh, is an awesome interview.
people. And we're extremely grateful for the work she's done. And still Thank you so much. John Gugner, District F, had a craw full <laughs> of Phyllis Fry walking by once a week. And so during the city council pop-off session, which is when they say whatever they want to, he said something really ugly about me and transgender people in general. I didn't hear it, but I found out about it. And I was, you know, I was there at, at, in the council offices, and I just lost it, and I just started crying. Well, I just want to thank her for everything she's done, and uh, it's nice to be able to, to know the history of our community, so I appreciate it, so thank you. It's amazing to, to hear the way it was so different just three decades ago. Yes, I'm telling my age, trying to, telling her age. When I was a teenager, when Phyllis was going, I was like, fighting for us. But because of her fight, it's really hard. I was able to run around Montrose without getting busted. Okay, Phyllis, we all love you and are very proud of you and of your courage. And uh, Ray told Trish and me one night when he was over for supper and we were visiting. He said, I heard the funniest story from the Vice Squad. And this is when I was lobbying like crazy to get rid of this horse. And, they, and he said, what's that? And he said, well, these two Vice Squad officers that I know, they came up to me and they said, where is this Phyllis Fry person? And Ray said, what do you mean? And he says, we are out in mass every night to every bar in Houston looking for Phyllis Fry so we can arrest her. <laughs> <laughs> and he said, She's at home at night with her wife. She's probably watching television. She's probably in bed asleep by 9.30. And they couldn't understand that. 